Thank you for joining us for the Treating Coronary Artery Disease webinar with Dr. Martin Milner. This will be one CE credit for naturopathic doctors, and this is sponsored by Endurance Products Company. Dr. Martin Milner is a naturopathic doctor, and he began practicing naturopathic medicine in 1983 after graduating from NCNM. He has remained at his alma mater since 1986 as professor of cardiovascular and pulmonary medicine. He is currently the CEO of Center for Natural Medicine, which he founded in 1991. Over 25,000 patients with heart disease have received care under Dr. Milner over the course of his career. He is world renowned for his natural treatment protocols for heart disease, menopause, and hypothyroidism. Dr. Milner is well published with textbook chapters, medical journal articles, and protocols in cardiovascular medicine, pulmonology, endocrinology, oncology, and environmental medicine. Dr. Milner has been the medical advisor for Health Science Institute and his publication since 1996. He has lectured extensively over the last 30 years nationally and internationally to physician groups and public audiences alike. He is currently consultant for Endurance Products Company. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Milner, and we can now get started. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's get started. We've got a lot to do. I need to disclose my conflict of interest, interest with Endurance Products Company, who's sponsoring this presentation and has formulated cutting-edge extended release, immediate release products supporting cardiovascular health. EPC was one of the sponsors of my private practice resident private practice residency positions through donations to NERC, and I am a paid consulting relationship with Epic EPC. Thank you. So this is an outline of what we'll be covering, and it's pretty straightforward. You can meander through that, take your time uh, when you need to, and catch up with me as we go. Okay, there are but modifiable and fixed risks for heart disease. The modifiable ones are the ones we can change, and they're listed here. Diet and alcohol, physical and activity, obesity, smoking, cholesterol, and all these blood markers that can change. And when they change for the better, your risk lowers, and they can go up. You can see the lipid panel, TMAO, that we'll be briefly talking about, which is a new marker and other markers like D-dimer for uh, hemorrhages and uh, thrombi and clot developments, lipoprotein A, homocysteine, CRP, ESR, bleeding times, which is the screening that we use for blood clotting risks. Diabetes is a huge risk factor for heart disease, as is hypertension. And even though we have all these modifiable risk factors, up to 40% of the people who develop coronary artery disease have no risk factors. We call it the silent killer or the disease that's silent. The ischemia can be asymptomatic. A lot of people don't have angina or chest pain, but they still have the disease. Okay. There's a calculator that you can look at online to, to assess risk in your patient populations. And the first that we need to talk about is the uh, forty the people who are under forty year, years of age. So they're too young to really risk stratify optimally, but you can calculate their risk, and you can do that with a risk calculator online. If you just search for QX calculate, the risk factor screening tool will come up, and you can see that. Risk only begins at 40 years of age. So we have this whole population from 0 to 39 that are additional risks in certain circumstances. And there are a whole slew of modifiable risk factors also, which we need to consider, that are additional discussion points for patients. And you'll see that in the coming up slides. You can prescribe a low statin, low-intensity statin in the conventional guidelines when um, the risk is 7.5% or less, up to a medium-intensity statin at a 10% risk. And 
you the conventional literature says that from 7.5 to 10 percent you can make some risk reduction that's worth considering Having said all that, the unmodifiable risk factors like your genetics and your parents' history are unmodifiable. And the same-sex parent having an MI before the age of 50 is your highest risk factor of, of all of them. Next highest is a first-degree relative, like a brother or a sister. And your uh, risk factor for men begins... Uh, at age 55, and for women at age 65. These are discussion points in the calculator. Before we get to that detail in the guidelines, these are the how the statins are classified as low intensity, moderate intensity, and high intensity. So a torvastatin and vesuvastatin have both high and moderate dose guidelines. You can see that there. And the lower intensity statins are on, on the right-hand column. And it's hard to see, but there's an A and a B and a C and a, a superscript that g gives you expectations on how much LDL reduction you'll, you'll have based on dose and risk. So this is a algorithmic slide that tells the whole big story. And you can see starting at age zero to 19, Lifestyle prevention and reduction of heart lipidemia risk or coronary artery disease risk can be modified and can be thought of modifying, but you're not going to want to use guidelines to treat with statins until the, your, your patient is at least 20 years of age, and you want to estimate lifetime risk. Now, you can see that people can go through the, the risk calculator and identify a level of risk, but then you want to consider other additional risk enhancers that aren't calculated in the calculator uh, that you would be using. So there's a lot of additional concerns that can happen that are in, in their own right potential legitimate additional risk factors. So you have a discussion with your patient and figure that out and if they're borderline, you want to consider a coronary artery and calcium score that you can use. And that, that can help you uh, firm up your risk factors. So this is a very valuable slide to look at if you're going to consider pursuing statin therapy as your care guideline. And diabetes increases risk significantly. So it's, it's a nice walk through this slide to get a sense of what's going on. Now, we're going to start with diet and go all the way through our protocols for natural medicine as a corollary to uh, the conventional standards. The first person who came up with any kind of an inkling that something could re reverse coronary artery disease was actually Nathan Pritikin. And Nathan Pritikin was a nutritionist. And he developed the Pritikin program after he established his own heart disease problems and went on a low fat high in uh, unrefined carbohydrates along with moderate exercise. And when his own disease improved substantially, he established the Pritikin Longevity Center in 1976 and became the director. And that was really the first facility of its kind. Then Dean Ornis came on the scene, and Dean is, is a medical doctor. Um, and he has uh, alternative leanings and was uh, assessing people's risk for coronary artery disease and developed a whole program which pioneered with this uh, study that was finally published in JAMA. And he took 28 patients, and 20 of them completed a five-year uh, dietary plan which was a vegan, low-fat diet in conjunction with exercise, smoking cessation, group psychotherapy, stress reduction, yoga. And they did it for five years. And you can see there was, there was significant reversal of disease, regression of coronary atherosclerosis. And the only way you can know that for sure is if a CT angiogram of the heart was performed 
to reassess the stenotic level of intensity of the coronary arteries. And there was more regression in, in the treatment group than the placebo group. And that continued over five years, and the longer they did the therapy, the, the better the progression and reduction of CAD developed. So that's pretty exciting. Problem is it was only 28 patients. <clears throat> so then Dr. Esselstyn, out of the Cleveland Clinic, pursued research in the China study on coronary artery disease risk. And he had a group of 24 patients, 23 men and one woman. And um, that was the group that uh, he, he changed their diet and gave them a high plant-based diet with low saturated fat and high fiber, moderate consumption of uh, any alcohol or caffeine, and uh, recommended a multiple vitamin mineral. And they were all put on a statin cholesterol which was the first statin. And when lovastatin became available, they became our drug of choice. But back then, when it was studied in 87, it wasn't the drug of choice yet. He also saw the patients every two weeks. And they had significant improvement, almost all of them, but that the end group was only 24. And um, both Esselstyn and Dean Ornish knew of many other patients who improved, but they weren't studied. So they, they, thought, they estimated that the end group of improved patients were maybe up to the 200s, but they weren't studied. And this diet is mapped out here, and you can see the diet varies significantly based on how many calories you're targeted. And you can see it starts as low as 1250 and goes all the way up to 4,000. And this just gives you a sense of how many grams of each of the food main, main food groups you, you would be taking. Now we're moving from diet, but before we leave diet, I want to just let everybody know that um, this is all a little ambiguous. While conventional medicine and most of the conventional community in alternative medicine thinks it makes sense for saturated fats to be excluded, there is some question about that and ambiguity about the definitiveness of it. But it's, it's clear from the literature that when people are studied for long-term dietary changes related to heart disease, a plant-based diet is number one, and a high-saturated animal fat diet is, in, is still not recommended under any study guidelines that I've been able to see. So we're taking a holistic approach here and giving people all the options that evidence can pursue and consider and then act upon. So um, let's keep moving here. This is um, a slide on exercise rehabilitation monitored with EKG treadmill testing. So it's designed for a cardiologist's office and maybe a large primary care office but um, you're probably not going to have an EKG treadmill in your office. So um, on the other hand, there are people who have advanced disease and they have unstable angina at rest, which means that they're getting chest pain that's, that's not only on exertion, but it, it shows up at rest. So their disease is more advanced. So you as a naturopathic physician would be collaborating with MD cardiologists and most likely the um, exercise tolerance testing advanced disease guidelines would be prescribed by an MD cardiologist to be done through the car cardiac uh, uh, therapy uh, department in the local hospital that they, they associate with and work through. So cardiac rehabilitation is done by the cardiac rehab f facility. And they have uh, treadmills and EKG monitoring equipment at every station, and they're set up and built up to do that. So uh, that's good information for you to know. I'm sure all of you do, but I just thought I'd mention it. 
And the people who are at, at the advanced disease level can't really do anything other than walking. And if they're having angina at rest, too, they could be contraindicated to do exercise because their heart just can't handle it. And they're at stage four disease. But you can improve collateralization by uh, doing frequent stepping, and you may be able to work these people up and then treat them with diet, exercise, stress, and natural medicines and get significant improvement. If your patient's in better fitness than um, a stage four advanced disease angina at rest patient, then we're going to work with them with regular aerobic exercise, calculating a target heart rate that they can maintain every other day. And that's the calculating uh, formula to use in, in, in um, aerobic exercise. And it's the same, in, uh, it's the same, uh, it's the same monitoring guideline for interval training in terms of determining target heart rates with that same calculation. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but there it is if you need it under interval training. So there's regular aerobic exercise, and I recommend that people do both aerobic and interval training. So to achieve your target heart rate with interval training, you need to exercise up to one minute. And you want to get your heart rate from, say, 60 at rest to the target, which may be 120 or 130 beats per minute as quickly as possible, but you only hold it for one minute. And as soon as that one minute of continuous exercise at your interval target heart rate has been determined, do you stop exercise? So you may be exercising for a minute and a half, 30 seconds to get up to your target and then one minute maintaining it. And then you would stop and wait until your heart rate comes to within 10% of the resting heart rate. If the resting heart rate was 70, then 10% of 70 is 7. So you would want to have that heart rate go from 70 to 77 beats per minute. And when it comes back down to 77 beats per minute, you want to maintain there. So you, you exercise to your target heart rate, not your resting heart rate. I made a mistake there. So you target to your aerobic heart rate calculated level during your exercise period, which is about a minute and a half, give or take. And then you rest until you get within seven, ten percent of your resting heart rate. So that ten percent above seventy is seventy-seven. And once you get down during during recovery to to seventy to seventy-seven beats per minute, then you do another cycle of training, and you do intervals of after intervals of rest, and you do five complete intervals. And you can do target in interval training exercise every other day with cardiac. Coronary artery and post-MI exercise tolerance and progressive rehab. Oh, this is after a patient's had an MI. They need to do some exercise tolerance testing. Coronary artery disease with no MI exercise tolerance testing is needed as well. We, they can use a pedometer. They can do walking and monitor steps and progress up to within 50 to 70% of their maximum heart rate. And there's some of the equipment that you would be using. Um, now there's exercise and there's recovering your cardiac uh, circulation. And we want to recover your cardiac circulation. So nutrients can be taken before exercise to increase uptake and utilization of oxygen. And then aerobic exercise with high flow rates of oxygen by mask can be added. And you can correct for poor uptake and utilization of oxygen inside the cells without excess oxidation or free radical stress with no unpaired electrons or ozone risk. So that's called in, in our vernacular oxygen multi-step therapy. It was developed by Dr. Von Arden of Germany and one of my first residents, Marvin Schweitzer. He traveled to Germany and studied the therapy, and it's awesome. The Dr. Von Ardeen did a lot of research 
in perfusion of oxygen in the venous and arterial system and determined that the lower buildup of venous arc, that he determined that if you lower the buildup of venous oxygen, which happens in a lot of people once they develop coronary artery disease, and increase the eff efficient utilization of intracellular arterial oxygen that's available at a cellular level. So he found that after people exercised, their venous oxygen levels went up and their actual arterial and arterial venous oxygen levels went down, which is it shouldn't be happening, but it does happen. And it's correlated pretty carefully with um, the degree of stenosis in the coronary arteries. So you can actually impact that at a deep level. It's a great read therapy. There aren't many doctors who have taken over. There's probably only maybe 50 in the whole country who are using this. It's awesome, and we've used it for 30 years, actually almost 40 years now. And this is the packet of nutrients. Now, even though you don't have the equipment to do oxygen multi-step therapy and you're not set up for it, you could consider giving a packet of nutrients before therapy, and you've got a whole array of nutrients to choose from. L-arginine is going to be crucial because it's one of the best vasodilating therapies. DMG, dimethylglycine, is a cofactor in, in, in uh, glutathione production, and it's an oxygenator and works great. Magnesium added is also crucial, and plenty of antioxidant support because you're going to be giving this exercise packet before exercise. So you want to oxygenate tissue and protect that same tissue that can generate free radicals. And um, we're, we're putting this packet together as nutrients before oxygen multi-step therapy, where they're on a treadmill with high flow rates of oral oxygen. But you can uh, apply this to your home considerations and exercise rehab and just not have the, the oxygen available. Or you can get, go through some training in oxygen multi-step therapy with one of the doctors that does it and start it yourself as a practitioner. Panax ginseng is also an excellent consideration, and ginsana is a product that specializes in, um, in documented, measured levels of ginsenocytes, so you know what you're giving and what patients are getting. And here's a picture of our clinic years ago. And here's the uh, oxygen mask. And there are goggles that are absolutely essential because the mask doesn't seal real well unless your face happens to be nice and round as his is. And so his mask fed so well that he didn't need tape over the mask to seal it in. The pressure wasn't moving his, his mask seal at all. And there's the H tank oxygen concentrators. And then you need a special regulator that goes all the way up to 15 liters per minute because it's very high flow rates of oral oxygen that you're delivering. Okay. Now we've got ST depression and ST elevation and ST ischemia. Here's the ST elevation due to the infarct, which causes an ST elevation. Here's the ST segment way above baseline. Here's the inverted negative. ST segment with a normal Q wave, and here's a massive Q wave that's taken over this whole EKG because there's a major myocardial infarct. So this is infarction, this is injury, and this is ischemia that's leading to injury. And you can see that in an end STEMI, you check for EKG changes, and there aren't any. Here's the normal EKG. Here's an ST elevated EKG, and here's an N STEMI where there's no significant depression. Maybe a little, little, there's some ST depression for ischemia here, but there's no MI. There's no ST elevation at all, like there is here. And you can see the blood clotting in and around the coronary artery. And this is progressive exercise in a patient of ours, and you can see how the ST segment's normal at rest, but not really. It had some changes at rest, and those changes get much more extreme. 
as slides progress. You can see it gets so extreme that we are forced to give sublingual nitroglycerin to the patient in recovery after we take him off the treadmill because he's got so much ST elevation, so much ST depression. <clears throat> and things cleared up for him upon doing that, and things ultimately resolved. But he's at great risk of a, an MI. And we lost him to follow up, so we don't know what actually transpired. What do patients most often think is the greatest contributor to their heart disease? Well, it's not their lipids, but it is stress. And you can see all of these physiological effects, and they're all associated with different changes in the heart and the vessels. You can look through that at your leisure. And this is all stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system that's out of control and causing those dysrhythmic responses to stress. Now, you can be stressed out as a type A personality. You can be stressed out by anger and frustration rather than love and appreciation. You can have continually unresolved emotional wounds and tachycardia and panic reactions that are rapid rhythm episodes and sympathetic overload. It can be, you can have emotional problems from being emotionally closed and repressing your emotions, poor boundaries, vulnerability, unresolved issues of vulnerability, difficulty in apologizing and forgiving when needed. And you can have an actual heart that breaks as a broken-hearted cardiomyopathic Takasubo syndrome, transient ischemic, transient, transient epic, apical ballooning or bulging of a balloon of the section of the, the bottom of the apex of the heart. And HRV, heart rate variability, measures the variation from the R to R interval of each EKG. And a normal EKG, even though it's in a sinus rhythm and it's close to being equally distant apart, if you put a computer up against it, there's normal inherent heart rate variability that happens between beats. And that tells us if you're, if you're properly stable or unstable in your, uh, in your heart rate variability and your emotional states around it. And what happens is when you put people through a stress restructuring program that has them breathe into the area and around their heart and then do some visualization and guidance, they feel better, more relaxed. They're in more of a state of love and appreciation, and there's less anger and frustration. And your heart rate variability wave summations show it. And this is stress restructuring that's been popularized and patented by Heart Math Institute. And it's easy. it's easy. You take a time out. You focus on the area in and around your heart. You recall a positive place or healing place you've been. Ask how you can respond more efficiently to the stress you're under. And listen to what your heart says. And those simple five steps dramatically improve heart rate variability and stress management. What well, we're up to botanicals. And our first is the master crataegus, otherwise known as Hawthorne. It treats high cholesterol, coronary artery disease, and post-MI excellently. It even treats both aneurysms and cardiovascular risk for hypertension, and that would be both bleed risk to some extent and ischemic risk. It, it's actually contraindicated in somebody who has a very high output state uncontrolled hypertension that's really high, hyperthyroidism, pregnancy are good examples. So it doesn't treat the hypotensive real well, and it doesn't treat the hypertensive real well. But overall, CHF, CAD, hypertension that's close to being controlled, it's great for the leaves and flowers are better in their research than the berries, even though the berries are the tasty parts. And they're high in oligomeric proanthrocyanidins, or OPCs, which are one of the polyphenolic family of compounds. It's a heart tonic that strengthens cardiac output and ejection fraction. 
strengthens the walls of the arteries. It's a great vasodilator, but it's mild in its vasodilating. It's a mild ACE inhibitor by mechanism. So it would treat high blood pressure pretty well and help control heart rate to some extent mildly. It has some additive effects when used with ditch. While there's no single active component, you can see the flavonoids, the hypericides, and the procyanidins that are all components of Hawthorne. That's probably why it's so useful in so many different disorders. It's got a lot of different active ingredients. Grapeseed extract also is a source. The grape is a source of resveratrol, as well as other compounds. And you can see all of these polyphenolic compounds that are antioxidative, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, and cardioprotective, liver protective, and nerve protective. So there's a lot of improvements that end up happening as a result of that. So you can see. And in the end, you're going to get rid of vasoconstriction and inflammation and hypoxia and make sure your lipids are protected and not oxidized. And the fix is getting all these labs back to normal and using whatever agents you use, like statins or natural products like niacin or magnesium as vasodilators. OMST shows up here. And antioxidants to reduce oxidized LDL. And they're listed here. And you end up with disease reversal. This slide's a little much to take in, but I thought you might like it. The, the, what are the uh, botanicals and what are their mechanisms and how do they match up against conventional medicines in the same category? And a lot of people who have coronary artery disease have hypertension as a secondary concern. So on the far left, you have diuretics here. And you can see the taraxacum petrosolinum as some of our herbal diuretics compared to HCTZ as a prescription one. And the medicines that block beta receptors, beta blockers, like uh, metoprolol, which is most people's favorite these days, and atenolol, which is going out of favor because it really doesn't work that well. And comparing that to um, acetylcholine agonists, like um, the precursors for acetylcholine, like pantothene and um, what else? The MAP protocol of building acetylcholine with pantothene and choline. They're the precursors that we use to build acetylcholine as, a, as an antagonist to high levels of adrenaline. And then there are uh, vasodilators like nitrites, L-arginine, magnesium, and the nitrates are both prescription drug and natural, and we'll be going over all that. But um, there's no per specific vasodilator category. Here are the ACE inhibitors, and they uh, reduce preload and afterload in the heart, which is good and put less pressure on the heart, which is good, and it, they lower blood pressure to some extent. And they're vasodilatory, they're vasodilatory to some extent. And then calcium channel blockers. So you can block calcium, you can block beta cells, you can block uh, vasodilation, and do a lot of good. And you can do it with natural agents that are analogs like the fish peptides or Hawthorne are alternatives to ACE inhibition. And magnesium is your base, best calcium channel blocker. And your best vasodilators are going to be niacin and Hawthorne. And arginine. Good. So... It's important to note that chest pain on exertion that resolves with rest is angina first and foremost until it is ruled out. 
And you want to assess clearly whether your person's coronary artery disease is mild, moderate, or severe. And you can do that with a standard exercise stress test. You can do it with coronary artery calcium scoring. And when your risk analysis for CAD is ambiguous and you're, you don't know for sure if the patient has it, it's worth considering a CAC score. Because if you're, less than, if you're zero, you don't have disease. And, the, and what happens is the CT scan cal categorizes how much calcium that you have and gives it a number. And if that number isn't zero, and then, and it's but it's under a hundred. Your risk is mild, and your risk risk only starts at greater than a hundred. But some people's test test numbers are at a thousand, and that's very high. So they likely have stenosis, and probably significant stenosis. CT angiograms with dye enhancement and heart rate control are the the gold standard for how to do this and get the most information and the most accurate information. And you can be at less than, your patient at the time of being CT scanned for this part of the test needs to be at a heart rate of 60 beats per minute or less. And a lot of people have resting heart rates in the 70s and they won't be able to get to less than 60 unless they're given a beta blocker before the test. So a lot of times they're given it in order to get the heart rate low enough so that they can see a good study. So here we go. If you take anything out of this lecture, you take that when somebody's hypertensive and has coronary artery disease, they need vasodilation. And they haven't had enough vasodilation over the years, along with a milieu that's loaded with lipids and oxidized LDL and plaque forming to some extent. So we need to get on it. And we need to do natural vasodilation, which is endothelial cell-derived nitrous oxide, providing the cell membrane and endothelial cells with the fluidity necessary to maintain stable vasodilation and the ability to slow down the extent of endothelial cell adhesions as a consequence of aging and related nitric oxide depletion due to the patient's burden of chronic inflammation. So you have the consequences of lack of nitric oxide. Whenever there isn't enough NO going around, there's not enough vasodilation. And then in a, in a milieu of chronic inflammation, it makes, harder, it makes it harder to vasodilate. So in a sense, endothelial cell adhesion is due to nitric oxide depletion. And they feed back to each other. So the endothelial cells, as they become more adherent, don't produce enough endothelial nitric oxide, and then the dilation becomes more constrictive. And, that, and as your, your dilation reduces and you become more stenotic from it, and the cell is weaker and more unable to generate nitric oxide and dilate. And you can see here, nuclear factor kappa B pathway Superoxide plus nitric oxide is going to give you peroxynitrite. Peroxynitrite is the biggest bad guy. It's the component that creates more chronic inflammation than anything else. If we can keep peroxynitrite low, you're going to get rid of a lot of vasoconstriction. And here's the bad boy, the insidious microscopic inflammation maker. And that's the molecular formula. And O is nitric oxide. You put two more oxygens on it, you have an unstable oxygen molecule floating around, and it's a bad environment for chronic inflammatory problems. And you can see here and read through the details of the biochemistry of all of this, but you can see this big pool of anti-inflammatory cell protective nitric oxide. You got a lot of nitric oxide, and you have very little peroxide. But as you age, the percentages reverse. So you have a massive pool of peroxide. You have a massive pool of peroxide at the bottom and not enough nitric oxide to keep it up. So this is about the most well-written understanding of all of this. And it was done in 2006. You should be ashamed that nobody's heard about it until now to speak of.
But in either case, in 1999, Ignaro won a Nobel Peace Prize for linking nitrous oxide as a single uh, messenger molecule to the evolution of coronary artery disease, among other diseases. But that's his book, and he won a Nobel Prize for all of his work. And this is a summary of the nitric oxide management in naturally occurring terms. So L-arginine is going to be the treatment of choice. The, the dose can be up to 3 to 6 grams BID, and we've taken some people up to 20 grams a day. So the doses can have to go very high because of control mechanism problems. And um, acetaminophen is a great anti-inflammatory medicine. It's probably the best there is at gobbling up um, inflammatory components and keeping them under control. The only risk for it with acetaminophen use that's significant is it can be very harmful to the liver if used from, with high doses for a prolonged period with no time release factor because then your liver gets hit with a whole lot of acetaminophen all at once and it can't metabolize it. But if you give NAC with it, it dramatically reduces the chance of liver enzyme elevation and liver damage. And you can keep people on high doses of acetaminophen effectively. The mildest approach is vitamin C. And you want to give vitamin C whenever you can. And this can be uh, adjusted accordingly in one of several ways. But you need to understand that when given, L-arginine is almost entirely absorbed through the intestinal brush border membrane. It undergoes extensive first-pass me metabolism with bioavailability ranging from 5 all the way up to 87%. It reaches peak plasma concentrations in 20 to 30 minutes and has a half-life of one to two hours, one and a half to two hours. So in the angina, in the arginine protocol, a lot of people blend their arginine with citrulline, which is another amino acid that turns into arginine. So it allows you to have a longer pertaining backup pool as needed. It's important that uh, if you're going to give high doses of, of um, L-arginine, that you know what nitric oxide is doing. So you can manage that one of several ways. You can just have the patient take the, the uh, L-arginine and then uh, measure with saliva glucose, with saliva st strips, the level of nitric oxide and get it up to a safe range. It gets a little more complex because... Um, As the nitric oxide levels go up, the peroxide levels need the peroxy nitrite levels need to be coming down. So you need to protect against inflammation and oxidative stress. So as your nitric oxide levels go up, your the oxidative metabolites can go up, and you don't want them to. You can give more nitric oxide, but that won't be enough in some patients. And there are certain patients who have high ADMA. That's asymmetric dimethyl arginine. They just start all out with too much ADMA, and you keep giving nitric oxide, and it just doesn't work because they're too loaded with ADMA. As the pool of arginine rises, it inhibits the blocking effects of ADMA on nitric oxide metabolism without reducing the amount of ADMA. So it can be a problem where you have to very delicately manage it. Now, ADMA is available as a blood test for under $75. So you can do that as needed and get your ADMA levels down. And once you get them down, you can use more L-arginine to raise uh, nitric oxide if needed. <clears throat> Plasma ADMA incidence of cardiovascular disease 
in one large community-based sample of 3,300 patients, asymmetric dimethylarginine was significantly associated with all-cause mortality, especially in non-diabetic individuals. So that's good to know. And this is a study of the use of NAC and L-arginine effectively treating diabetics where their blood pressure lowered, their oxidative LDL lowered, and their glutathione went up. Here we go. This is a slide that talks about the possibility of nitric oxide being um, pro-inflammatory to lung epithelium. And it's an ACE inhibitor, which we know, that can cause coughs as a side effect. And you can add nitric oxide to somebody on an ACE inhibitor. You could theoretically make your, their coughing worse. But arginine may improve lung vasculature and improve their function. I've seen it go both ways. So you just need to be aware of it. What happened to, to this? Help. There we go. Nitric oxide can be pro-inflammatory to the lung epithelium. And while that's a risk factor, can also improve lung function. So I haven't really seen, seen L-arginine cause these problems. I've seen them, it more likely help them. But it's important to realize that if you have patients on ACE inhibitors, and you're giving them L-arginine, and their lung functions are getting worse, that may be why. Okay. Now we're up to trying to control lipids, decreasing elevated lipids, and improving oxidative stress on the lipid environment. So niacin does a lot. And it works great with pantothene and red yeast rice. So let's go on. This is a summary slide that we're going to skip and go on to niacin. Nicotinic acid is effective in lowering total cholesterol and triglyceride levels and raises HDL cholesterol. There is evidence that in reducing total mortality in secondary preventive trials. That's great. That's all what we want niacin to do, and it does that. This was way back in 1993 when the nicotinic acid was non-slow-released, immediate-released niacin that was studied. At a mean follow-up duration of 11 plus or minus 7 months and a mean dosage of 1,400 milligrams a day, the group that had 13% reduction of total cholesterol, a 31% increase in HDL, and a 32% decrease in cholesterol to HDL ratios. That's awesome. There are short and long-term side effects. The biggest problematic ones are liver enzyme elevations and liver stress or damage, hyperuricemia gout, and higher glucose or exacerbated diabetic blood sugar numbers. Now, it's really important to realize that side effects can be significantly reduced by using sustained released niacin rather than immediate released niacin or rather than hydroxypropyl cell, cell, methyl cellulose slow release developments and shy in the side of wax matrix because it's a much better slow release agent. And you'll get less liver toxicity and less gout number exacerbations. So it's worth pursuing things that way. So niacin, slow-release wax matrix, is a different curve than other slow-release systems. And you can see the slow-release phasing here is peaking at about six hours, but it's lasting almost 12 hours. 
and that allows for perfect BID every 12 hour dosing with no overlapping. There'll be very little overlapping in that regard. And Brian Edwards is an MD lipidologist who published the book Tubby Theory and Plan in 2010. And he has a combination protocol for plaque reversal using niacin and has reversed plaque in hundreds of patients and has proven it with his testing methodologies. He's baseline people's coronary artery calcium score, score with their CIMT, cardiac intimal medial thickness, an advanced lipid panel, panel for particle size in conjunction with uh, other therapies. And um, his advanced panel is this, and then his treatment was simvastatin in conjunction with uh, enduracin, which is a wax matrix slow release niacin, and gave one every 12 hours at breakfast and at dinner, and then gradually increases the dose by 500 milligrams every one to three weeks and gradually gently titrates up to a maximum of extended release pills at 1,000 milligrams or two 500 milligram pills every 12 hours. And he shot for ideal non-HDL cholesterol of less than 80. So you combine total cholesterol with non-HDL cholesterol. And the triglycerides should be less than 100. And those were his targets for where he wanted people to be. And when things got really heavy and there was a severe non-response to niacin and niacin was maximized, he came up with this severe protocol where he would work people up to 2,000 milligrams every 12 hours. So that's twice the normal tolerated dose that he was using before this phasing got started. But realize he's using 4,000 milligrams of endurancing, which is wax matrix protected niacin. That can be tolerated at higher doses. And he takes a high intensity statin and gives it at a very low dose and gradually use, raises it and was able to reverse plaque in the coronary, in the carotid artery with a CIMT. That's a carotid intimal media thickness test that's measuring plaque, in the, not in the heart, but in the coronary arteries because you can get to them with a non-invasive ultrasound. So he was able to prove the plaque reversal by CIMT re-imaging, maintaining manageable or optimal levels achieved and monitored. This is awesome that we have an oral therapy that can reduce coronary artery disease. Joseph Keenan is a medical doctor who's worked with niacin therapy for years as well. And he's got a book that he published. Oh, that's the niacin breakthrough. And among the other things he wrote in the book, are the comparisons of the Thrive with the AIM-I trials that were the trials that said that niacin in combination with statins didn't have any additional benefit in um, treating heart disease. So the study was stopped at three instead of seven years. However, a post hoc analysis in 2013 shows showed trends toward reducing cardiovascular events and death in the subgroups with the highest levels of triglycerides. So that that that's worthy of noting because it wasn't a totally negative, non-responsive scenario. And then the niacin that was studied wasn't time released. It wasn't wax matrixed. So uh, the, the jury's not out yet, even though the conventional jury's out but the alternative uh, practitioners still have an option here of considering and pursuing, especially in statin intolerant patients, some of these protocols.
Out of all of the products we've studied and used clinically, it seems that niacin far and away is the most effective and has the best research behind it and does all of the lipid changes that we need done. But you also have the options of adding red yeast rice as a low-dose statin alternative and plant sterols. Plant sterols work by increasing uh, the tendencies of cholesterol to get in the gut and stay in the gut and not get absorbed out of the gut as much. Here are uh, the summary slides for the, the anthrocyanidin and polyphenolic effects of grapeseed extract and resveratrol and the systems that are affected and how they're managed. So enjoy that and consider giving it. Here they are, our polyphenolic friends. Converting small LDL to large LDL, which is best for the best non-drug evidence for doing that. And I think the evidence for niacin and changing the shape of the LDL molecule is better than, than, than statins. It just works better and does it more effectively. It lowers total cholesterol, LDL, total triglycerides, And yeah, here's the LDL oxidation slide that I wanted you to see. Niacin works the best. The next is ECGC. And then resveratrol or CoQ10 or vitamin E. And some of these other products, this is the best down to the worst studies. The least amount of evidence is down here. And the most is up in here. This is a summary of additional treatments that can be used. And we're up to statins. Oh, wait, excuse, stints, excuse me, not statins, but stints. So the conventional world, once coronary artery disease is serious and, and found, is going to be pursuing whether... It happens in an ER and goes into the cath lab so that they can do an angiogram and see clearly what what the pathology is and how bad it is and how amenable the patient is to stinting and stint them if needed or they may be untreatable with a stint and need bypass surgery. They may have had multiple stints and, and had a bypass in the past and there's no point in using more drug therapy because it's not going to work. And then they go on to ball therapy, which is an acronym for conventional medicines. Uh, beta blockers, aspirins, lovastatin, lisinopril approach. And when that's all said and done, at least a third of the angioplasties are done on people not in imminent danger to relieve chest pain. And these patients are no more likely to die or suffer a heart attack if initially treated with drugs alone. So there's drug alone therapy that works as well as stints. And here's the ball treatments. Beta blocker, aspirin, which is out of favor, lisinopril and Lipitor. Or statin, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, and the blood thinner. Topolol is the main treatment for the uh, beta blocking effects and we're going to build up acetylcholine to inhibit beta blocking effects or use that as an alternative to a beta blocker. Uh, it's important to note that Plavix or Clopidogrel is a gold standard of choice conventionally for anybody who's being stinted because you want to minimize the tendency to form atheromic plaques and clots and derangements in the lining of the 
vessel that's been stinted over the course of dealing with having been stinted. So endothelation needs to be optimized with a thin blood environment. And then there's also hormones. And the main hormones that we we need to consider and pursue are estrogen, progesterone to a lesser extent, the female hormones, which can cause clots to form and make sure they're not, and keep the blood thin and monitor people. So bleeding times are the best method for monitoring And cardiac catheterizations followed by targeted angioplasties with a polluting stint are deployed. And then people usually put on metoprolol to give them a rest in their heart for one to three weeks, sometimes one to three months, depending upon the clinical scenario, what the resting heart rate is, how they respond to exertion, that kind of thing. And then they can be gradually weaned off they're also going to be prescribed a statin with a beta blocker, keep their heart rate slow, and uh, plavix. And that's the conventional scenario. And th this is the ending of our presentation here, and this kind of gives you a big picture or assessment. But it's important to realize that you have vessel disease that is one of the criteria for the severity. And depending upon the vessel, excuse me, depending upon the vessel that's injured and the extent of occlusion, that's going to classify whether the coronary artery disease is mild, moderate, or severe. Can you have severe coronary artery disease with just one vessel being damaged? The answer is yes. If it's the unfortunate left main coronary artery that perfuses the largest area of the heart, including the pretty much entire left ventricle. So severe one left main coronary artery being blocked at 95%, if, if that goes, you won't survive your, your heart attack because the too much, there's too much blood perfusing by the left main coronary artery. Maradit. Investing involving two to three vessels, 70 to 90 percent occlusion is a big ballpark for a lot of m moderate disease. And then the mild disease is 50 to 70 percent blockage of one to two vessels. The LAD is the most common and it perfuses a large area of the left ventricle, but it won't take your life necessarily unless it's a severe occlusion. So that's important. And then all of our treatments are summarized here that you want to consider, and then mix and match all of what we're talking about to deal with what, whatever we need to do. And of course, everybody needs to lower triglycerides and cholesterol and get that in shape, but you want to modify all the other risk factors that we have listed there. So you can read through this, and that'll help give you a guide to treatment options. Thank you. Here's a list of the slow-release products that are available through our sponsor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Milner, for that wonderful information. For attendees um, who would like to get a certificate, please watch for an email after this recording. And if you have any questions, you can email joe at endur, e -N -D -U -R, dot com. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Milner. Thank you.